Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. So now we're looking at the web packet that the host A was holding before it had been able to compose it as far as layer four, but it couldn't put the layer three IP header on there because it didn't know the destination IP address yet. It's just received that from the DNS server, so it can carry on composing that packet. It knows that the destination is 10.10.12.10. .10 .10. And it sees that that is on a different IP subnet, so it knows that the destination MAC address is its default gateway, which it already knows is at 4.5.6. It will then put that web traffic onto the physical wire. So here's our HTTP GET request. The source MAC is 1.2.3. The destination MAC is the default gateway, 4.5.6. Source IP is its own IP address, 10.10.10.10, and the destination IP is a web server at 10.10.12.10. That will hit switch one, which will send the packet to router A, which it already has in its MAC address table. The packet will come into router A. It sees that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10, .10 .10 .10, and in our example, router A does not have any interfaces in the 10.10.12.0 slash 24 subnet. So in that case, it's going to need a route to get there. The route can be either statically configured by an administrator or learned dynamically through a routing protocol, which also would be configured by the administrator. We're gonna cover how to configure static routes and routing protocols in later lectures. So for our example, let's say that the administrator has already configured a static route for 10.10.12.0 slash 24 with the next hop address of 10.10.11.2, which is on the next hop router. Router A has an Ethernet interface in the 10.10.11.0 subnet. It doesn't know the MAC address for the next hop address of 10.10.11.2 yet though. So it will hold the HTTP packet from host A and it will send an ARP request out that interface in the 10.10.11 subnet looking for 10.10.11.2. So there goes the ARP request. It's from 10.10.11.1, saying it's looking for 10.10.11.2. What's your MAC address? It comes from a source MAC of 5.6.7, going to the layer two broadcast address of f.f.f. The ARP request will hit router B's interface at 10.10.11.2, and it will see that the ARP request is for itself. It will send a unicast ARP reply back to router 1. While it's doing that, router B will add an entry for router A, mapping the IP address 10.10.11.1 to MAC address 5.6.7 to its ARP cache. So the ARP reply goes back, it says, hey, I'm 10.10.11.2 and here's my MAC address of 6.7.8 going to the destination MAC of 5.6.7. Router A will get that information and it can now forward the HTTP packet it was holding to router B. So it's the original HTTP GET request from host A. The source IP is always the same, so it's still 10.10.10.10 on host A, going to the destination IP of 10.10.12.10 on the web server. But the source and destination MAC addresses will get updated for this hop. So the source MAC is 5.6.7, the destination MAC is 6.7.8. Router B will receive the HTTP packet and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10. Router B has an interface in the subnet of 10.10.12.0 slash 24, so it knows the destination should be available out that port, but it doesn't know the MAC address of 10.10.12.10 yet, so it will hold the HTTP packet and send an ARP request out that 10.10.12.1 interface. 
So there goes the ARP request. It's from 10.10.12.1, looking for 10.10.12.10, asking for the MAC address. Comes from a source MAC of 7.8.9, going to the layer 2 broadcast of f.f.f. The ARP request will be received by switch 2. Switch 2 will add an entry in its MAC address table, mapping router B's MAC address of 7.8.9 to port 1, and it will then flood that ARP request broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on. So that will be sent out of port 2. The ARP request will hit the web server's interface at 10.10.12.10, the web server will process the ARP request and see that it is for itself. The web server will then send a unicast ARP reply back to router B. And it will add an entry for router B, mapping IP address of 10.10.12.1 to the MAC address of 7.8.9 to its ARP cache. That's its default gateway, so it will use that whenever it needs to send traffic to another IP subnet. So the ARP reply will go back saying I'm 10.10.12.10, here's my MAC address of 2.3.4, going to the destination MAC of 7.8.9. Switch 2 will get that and add an entry to its MAC address table, mapping the web server's MAC address of 2.3.4 to port 2, and Switch 2 will then send the ARP reply out only port 1, which Router B is plugged into, which it already has in its MAC address table. So there goes the ARP reply unchanged from the web server. Router B will get that and add, add an entry for the web server mapping IP address 10.10.12.10 to MAC address 2.3.4 to its ARP cache. And then Router B will send the HTTP request it was holding to the web server. So again, it's the original source IP on host A, 10.10.10.10, the original destination IP on the web server of 10.10.12.10. The MAC addresses will get updated with the source MAC of 7.8.9 and the destination MAC of 2.3.4. Switch 2 will send that HTTP request out only port 2, which the web server is plugged into and which the switch already has in its MAC address table. And finally, the HTTP GET request will reach the web server. So it comes in on the physical wire. The web server will look at the layer 2 header and see that the destination MAC address is 2.3.4, which is itself, so it will carry on processing it. It will look at the layer 3 IP header and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10, which again is itself. It will carry on processing it. It will look at the layer 4 transport header, see that it is TCP port 80, so it knows it's web traffic. It will then carry on up through the session, the presentation, and the application layer. And the web traffic has now reached the web server. Okay, the ARP and MAC address tables are already built, so any subsequent packets in either direction will flow without any need for ARP requests or switch flooding. So let's say the second packet in the session goes from host A. So it will send the HTTP GET request. It comes from a source MAC of 1.2.3, going a destination MAC of its default gateway at 4.5.6, the source IP 10.10.10.10, destination IP of 10.10.12.10. It already has the destination MAC address in its ARP cache, so it can just immediately send the packet. That will get to router A, which also already has everything in its ARP cache. So the HTTP GET request is still from source IP 10.10.10.10, going to the web server at 10.10.12.10. The MAC addresses will be updated to be relevant for this hop, which was a source MAC of 5.6.7, a destination MAC of 6.7.8. That will hit router B. And again, it's got an interface in the subnet of 10.10.12.0, so it knows what interface to send it out of. Source IP remains unchanged, 10.10.10.10. Destination IP still 10.10.12.10. Source MAC gets updated to 7.8.9. The destination MAC gets updated to 2.3.4. And we've got traffic going end to end. Okay, so we got there. We covered the complete life of a packet from end to end. 
and you now have a really good knowledge of how IP networking works. Honestly, there's really not much more to it than that. What we're going to be covering in the following lectures is the different features and functions that are available on our routers and switches to support that and how to configure them. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.